PowerPoint, and I'm not even going to attempt to follow that, because how could you? Um, but just to support what Phil was saying, we did some <coughs> research a while ago, we met with some research for us, on the effects in teaching of the new accountability system and essentially competition as opposed to collaboration being a model that the government, not only this government, um, coalition government, but also uh, new Labour government before that was pushing competition between <coughs> teachers, competition between schools, and in terms of, and um, as well as talking about the impact on pupils, it's this report exam practice. So the impact on pupils of the way that the school system, education system is going, um, where kids end up feeling like they're just being put through a process and to get exams at the end of it. We also had some, um, a bit of time that was looking at the impact on teachers. And a couple of quotes from teachers in this. Um, one from a secondary school great, graded as outstanding by Ofsted was that there's a real sense of fear and we're driven by the senior leadership team to work harder and harder and push the pupils harder and harder. And another saying teachers are suffering often on long-term sick leave because of their fear of the performance management system. And interestingly, more than 60, about 70% of teachers were saying, I'm spending a disproportionate amount of time on documenting the fact that I have taught and what the impact is, not on teaching. No teacher minds spending their time on teaching, but what they're spending their time on is just keeping records of what they've done so that they can prove that they've done it rather than actually be teaching itself. So um, just to support what Phil was saying. Um, I want to start somewhere slightly different, but I think ends up not too far away from the message that Bill was giving. So I'm going to say something about the current stats on the scale of the problem about bullying at work, which is that in a TUC survey last year, it was said that about a third of people are admitting, and I use admitting in the sense that most people don't really want to talk about bullying or anything that's happened to them. But in terms of almost a sort of perpetrator, manager <coughs> to employee bullying, 30% of people said that they've been bullied. It's more likely to be women who say that they've been bullied. And it's also more likely to be what we call the other protected group, basically discriminatory bullying. Um, work that we've done in education shows, again, linking to appraisal, that in our surveys, um, the people who are top of the pile for not getting pay progression as a result of performance management appraisal are black teachers and women teachers returning from maternity leave or, or doing part-time work. And clear, again, discretion for those who are making those decisions and they're exercising it in a particular way. Um, of those 30% who said that they'd been bullied at work, 72% said that it was a manager who bullied them. But obviously, workplace bullying isn't only about bullying from managers. It can also be um, bullying or harassment from colleagues. And in schools, we also get harassment from pupils sometimes and from parents. And um, part of my remit at the MUT is when we're dealing with some policy matters also has covered casework and we have taken a number of cases, but we certainly um, have had homophobic bullying cases, which have ended up going through legal processes, um, as, well, as well as racist um, bullying and harassment. 36% of those people say they, they've left work as a result, and as we all know, lots of people will be taking short-term, long-term sick leave. The impact on the individual, anyone who's been bullied will know that it's just crushing. Um, it's isolating, crushing, undermines confidence, affects people's relationships in work and out, affects really the people's whole lives. Um, health and safety reps say that it's one of the top five hazards at work, dealing with bullying, dealing with managers, and sometimes your colleagues, it's one of the top five hazards at work. And this is nothing new, it's been going on for years, and it continues despite all the work that so many of us try to do. I think that one of the reasons that we haven't been as successful as we should be is because really the way that we think about 
dealing with workplace bullying. So the common advice to anybody, if you look on the internet, if you look at um, if you get look at a, a workplace pamphlet, will be pretty similar to what they say in uh, procedures that are set up about how to deal with it. That you first of all you try to talk to the bully yourself. Now, of the cases that I've known, there's very few people who want to go and talk to the bully, even if they take somebody with them. That's really unusual. Um, I think it's it probably only in what you might think of as people who are the most robust who would you know, even consider doing that. After that, you get into procedures such as grievances. Is it an employment tribunal case? Is it a breach of contract? All those kinds of things. But what that does is really sort of four main problems with that, I think. One is that you start to have to try and define. It's, it gets very legalistic and individualistic. You have to start to try and define what is bullying, what is harassment, what are the features that make it one or the other. Now, this section is called bullying and harassment, and I'm not going to even try to say this is bullying and this is harassment, because for me that's not really the route that we want to go down. It starts, you start to look in a, look at a cul-de-sac of details around how do you define this, how do different people see it. Do you look at it objectively, do you look at it subjectively? As well as it, a, a difficulty around the definitions, you look at how easy is it for an individual to come forward and say, actually, I'm being bullied. The whole, the whole um, issue around bullying is that it undermines confidence and makes people isolated. It makes it incredibly difficult to do something like that. Very few people want to stick their head above the parapet and say, I've been bullied. <clears throat> it's almost impossible to get really good evidence, and that's, very, that's a real problem with that approach. So members that I've dealt with, they'll say, for example, okay, a head teacher came up to me today and said, oh, you're not looking very well, oh dear, poor you. you know, are you sure you're really up to it? <laughs> now, in one context, when that's written down on a piece of paper, that could look supportive. But if you look at the context in which that says, I could know that people know that from the, the groan that went around the room. Someone who's been bullied, been through capability proceedings perhaps, been off sick, and then tried to return to work. A head teacher says that to you, and you see that in a very different light. You know that that's getting at you, trying to say, actually, you're not up to it, and I'm watching you, and it could start again. And finally, outcome. Again, anyone that I've dealt with who's been bullied who wants to do something about it, what they say is, I just want this to stop. I don't want to get compensation, I don't want to go through a lengthy process, I don't want to get stuck in legal proceedings, I just want it to stop and I want to be able to get on with my work without being bullied. So we started to think about other ways of trying to deal with this because clearly, although we will do those things and we will support people if they want to take those processes, it wasn't enough on its own. So we now try to fix those within a much wider strategy. And part of the reason for it crystallised for me a few years ago when um, one of, at MET annual conference, quite unusual for anything to crystallise for me, but at, at the conference that it did, um, one of our head teacher members, because we do have head teacher members, he'd been a, an ex-president of the union, and he'd not been very active in the union for a few years, and we had a debate about mental health issues in the workplace and bullying and harassment and workload stress. And he came to the microphone and made an incredibly moving speech about why he hadn't been active in the union for the last few years. As a head teacher, he had had a breakdown. And he'd had a breakdown, and the way that he put it was that, and I hope I'm expressing it in the right way, but the way that he put it was that the way the culture of schools had changed so much, the culture of education had changed so much, as I was saying, from collaboration and trying to and mutual support. Now, obviously, this is sort of the high point ideal of what it used to be, but I think many older teachers will say they did used to be a feeling of working together and collaboration. Um, and certainly with the London Challenge, that was something where actually we got improved outcomes for pupils because of that, but through collaboration. That's completely changed through the kind of things that Phil was talking about, through austerity, through the competition between schools and against, against each other, and teachers having to compete, compete against each other, both for status and resources, but also now for pay. 
um, that this has become such a difficult process for him as, a, as an MUT head teacher that he felt that he either had to try to absorb some of that pressure from league tables, from Ofsted, from government, he either had to absorb it himself or pass it on to his colleagues. And I know that's something that Phil was talking about. And as a result of it, he had a breakdown and ended up leaving the profession. And from that, we thought we really have to find another way of dealing with these things. So we've added additional, an ad additional element to how we now try and deal with workplace bullying. We try and take a much more collective approach. Thank you. Yeah, but try and take a much more collective approach. We encourage reps to do regular, and this is whether they know of any problems or not, but to do regular surveys around stress, around bullying, around workload. We try to encourage them to then, where there appears to be a problem, which at the moment is pretty much everywhere, but where there seems to be a problem, to take it up as a collective issue. If there's a case of bullying that comes to us as a piece of casework, again, we're trying to take a collective approach. We might, if a member comes to us, we might do, again, a survey of members in the school that help hold a school meeting. In some cases, we found that one person who's brave enough to come forward will say, I don't think anybody will support me, I'm the only one. But in almost every case we've had, we found that individually, in an isolated way, lots of colleagues are saying, actually, I'm feeling bullied too, or there's been a previous example, or there's going to be another example. So we try and bring people together. There's been cases where we haven't been able to do that on school premises. So in most cases where we can get a, hold a meeting, employers um, head teachers will agree that we can hold a meeting in school. In these cases, quite often, our members don't want it to be in school because they're afraid that they'll be watched or that somebody will be sent to spy on the meeting. So we have to come up with all kinds of mechanisms to, to hold a meeting outside school or to exclude various people from it, um, leadership team members or, or others. Because of course we're a union where head teachers, deputies, assistant heads or the leadership team can, can be a member of the union. Um, but sometimes the group will tell us, well, this is, a, this is a head teacher we want to be part of our group, and in other cases they'll say, actually, we think they're only in the union in order to see what the union group's doing and to be able to sort of have a bit of surveillance over it. But we've had to come up with all kinds of other mechanisms, mechanisms which have to be very context specific and adapt um, in order to try and take away the individual nature of it, to give people the strength to see that actually they can support each other, that there are others who are going through this, this at work. And although in some cases that sounds like it's a softer option, some people say that's a softer option, you're not, you're not taking the, the perpetrator of this to an employment tribunal, you're not challenging them. Actually, in some cases, we've been, I would say, more successful with it than we have been with the individualistic approach. We've had head teachers who have so we collect all this evidence, we get it to the governing body. There's not many governors who, if they're faced with 30 or 40 members of staff all giving um, statements saying, this is what's happened to me, who will ignore it or feel that they can ignore it. So we have had those meetings, we've had successes with head teachers being moved, hopefully not moved to go and do it somewhere else, but certainly being taken out of the school. We've had some who've been dismissed, We've certainly had culture changes where new processes are being brought in and new people brought in. So for us, it's been a really successful way of trying to deal with the problem. The reason that I say I think it links up with what Phil was talking about is that it's about workplace culture. It's about trying to get her, it's trying to say we need a positive culture, we need an inclusive and supportive culture and trying to make that happen in a really active way. It takes a lot of hard work, it takes a lot of resources, but where we've been able to do it, then it's been a fantastic outcome for the people who've been involved and they've been really pleased.